genuinely love our intro. I do too. Nice job. I think it's so dope. <laughs> That's all you. That's a great. Uh, it's both of us, and it's awesome. All right, let me share our show with people that care to watch us because it's cool as crap. And hi, welcome to show four. Hi, this is fun. Show four is going to be better than three. Three was awesome. And it's also better than two. It's just getting better by the day. Right. I love math. <laughs> okay. We are live. Come hang out with us. On a long weekend. Long weekend. Did you forget it was Easter? Because I know I did. I did. I totally did. I'm so grateful somebody told me that we I had... Uh, work off tomorrow because I didn't realize I did and that's super convenient because it's also my birthday weekend so bonus <laughs> bonus I saw bonus. A I saw a creepy Easter bunny the other day that's what reminded me that it was Easter like, what made it a creepy bunny it was a six foot stuffed bunny sitting in a bar in a hotel lobby <laughs> oh oh, oh. So like, that, that, that kind of creepy okay what is a creepy bunny doing at the bar at a hotel lobby? I don't get it. Well, it only does one thing there. Um, can we just talk about how awesome the lunch was we just had? So incredible. Yep. So fun. Genuinely meeting cool people that have a lifetime of incredible stories is is unmatched, right? <laughs> Chooch learned how to fly in what year? 1927? Uh, I think he was born maybe in 27. So he, I don't know. He was 20. So 47, oh, maybe 1950. Yeah. Even yeah. still, that was unbelievably cool. But speaking of unbelievably cool, we have an incredible show set up for us today. We've got Leo joining us here in just a second. So before we get that started, let's welcome you guys to our show. And we're back, and we've got Leo. Hey, Leo, how are you doing? Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. Hear gotcha. you. All right. Loud and clear. Okay. Thank you so much for making time. It's so great to see you. It is. Likewise. It's been a while. Yeah. So you're in Colorado right now? I am. Colorado nice. Springs. Good. Nice. So how, how, often, how often do you uh, spend the time in Hawaii? Are you doing 50-50 or what's the Hawaii-Colorado schedule? So I was doing about 50-50 pre-COVID. And then all throughout COVID, it's been 95 Colorado, 5 Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> so it was somewhat of a blessing for me because my wife and uh, three younger kids moved back to our home here in Colorado. So having stretches of time away from them was, was getting tough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been hard to get back and forth between Hawaii with the restrictions, right? Yeah. They had at one, in the beginning part of COVID completely shut down travel. So it made it a no brainer. I just stayed put here and didn't yeah. expect it to last so long, but um, I don't think it, any it, of us it, did. You know? So yeah, it was, it was truly a blessing. Hawaii's starting to open up now. So I'm going to have to start, start getting back at some point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good. So who's all in Hawaii? It's your brother for sure. And then who else is all out there? So my family and my wife's family is both entirely out there. But okay. that's, where, that's where work is for me now is in Hawaii. All our clients are in Hawaii. Okay. And um, so I'm going to have to, um, uh, I'm probably going to go back in early May. Uh, we got some big meetings um, so yeah, we have a lot to catch up on. A lot has happened in the, in the last, since we, you and I spoke last, Ben. Yeah. It's been almost a year, probably right around a year. I was, I was in Mexico hanging out right. and right. we had connected and you were, you were managing money for, uh, is it Raymond James still? Yeah. It's, so it's Raymond James is the, is the broker dealer route we're with. Um, so we formed the go is group, uh, back in 2016, oh, my brother, cool. Um, I joined him in 2010. Yeah. Uh, simultaneously, I was a licensed agent at the time, but trying to transition out of that industry, which I have completely now, because my last my last player had since retired in 2018. 
And so it's just strictly doing uh, investment advising, consulting to um, make most of our book of business is institutional work with a lot of the, the big um, construction unions back in Hawaii. Okay. Is nice. this your group here? I, I like that. Yeah, she's nice. cool to draw. <laughs> Pull that okay. up. Almost. You guys are based in Honolulu. Does does your brother live in Hon in Honolulu? Yeah. So no. Well, he, yeah, he lives on on island on the island of Oahu, not specifically in Honolulu, which is the which is the the main city of of Oahu. He lives out on the windward side, which is a beautiful uh, in Kani in Kani Ohe, which oh, is yeah. on the side of the lush green side of the island. So every yeah. island has a green, really lush tropical side and a more arid side on the leeward side. Yeah. So he's up right there, right by there, uh, all the Marines, right? Correct. Big, yeah. big Marine base. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nice. That's beautiful on that side. It is. It is. So what's the catch up? What have you been up to over the last year? What was that? What's the catch up? What have you been up to over the last year? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, just working, um, working hard and uh, remotely from Colorado Springs. Uh, actually, we had our best years, believe it or not, in 2020 and 2021. Um, awesome. Biggest revenue years. Uh, it was a phenomenal. Um, and it, it kind of, the, the cool part about the whole thing, it, it, it kind of forced, COVID did force a kind of an experiment on my brother and I of working um, non-traditionally, me from here, him from there, and no meetings in person. Everything is pretty much on Zoom. And yeah. that, was, that, that was, um, you know, we navigated it pretty well. Like I'm sure most um, people had to do who are, who are usually meeting face-to-face -face with clients. Um, um, yeah, but we had... It, it was a, it was a great two years. Obviously, it was a blessing for me to stay kind of put with the family. Um, and cool part is we're our family's growing, so we have a couple. We now have six grandkids and expecting our seventh one here uh, wow. in a, in about a month. Oh Congrats. my god, that's awesome! Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, we're pretty stoked about it. Being a being a grandpa is just amazing. It's truly, uh, I never thought I would enjoy it so much, but I really do. Yeah, that's awesome. What do you What do you like to do with the grandkids? What do you take them outside and play, or do you take them uh, putt putt, or like uh, play yeah, we catch? Do all kinds of things with them. I put a huge swing set in the backyard, trampoline. Because we have some, you know, we're on like a half an acre here. So we, we have space to do some stuff. So got the big swing set. So whenever they come over, they can go out of there and just uh, be kids. And um, get the big trampoline. Whenever we have snow, we have a long kind of a, our house sits way back. And our lot is kind of uh, at a, there's a lot of elevation change. So we can sort of do some serious um, uh, sledding. On yeah. The <laughs> get some good bang for the buck on that <laughs> yeah, yeah that's nice <laughs> yeah so um really enjoying that um so all our kids are here except for one our oldest is still in hawaii but all uh, four of our five kids are here in colorado do you uh, have the kind of trampoline that has the net around it or you just let them let huge, them fall a huge six foot net around it yes yeah <laughs> Nice. I only yeah. broke one bone in my body and it was off a trampoline. And it's because back in the 90s, nobody gave a crap yeah, about now, whether or not you now, were safe. Now it's like every every trampoline comes with that, that big, huge net. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> keep them in, keep them safe. Well, yeah, yeah with, that, with that many grandkids, you need a net around the trampoline. You need a net around the house, probably a net around the I don't know, playground or something too. keep them all. We, we, we need uh, gates and uh, yeah. Cause they're still young. The oldest is only just turned six. And so it's, it's pretty lively. It's pretty lively when they come over uh, just the yelling and the screaming and the chaos. Yeah. But that so, volume uh, cranks right up. Well, oh yeah. It goes from quiet as a library to just uh, 
chaos. Massive chaos. But <laughs> we, we, uh, we, we love it. We love it. At the end of the day, we love just being with them and spending time with them. And uh, we're just grateful to have them with us so we can uh, be a part of their lives as they're growing. Yeah. Well, let's, it, let's go ahead, Ben. Well, I'll say uh, from working from home, that's so nice probably because if you were on a traditional kind of pre-COVID schedule, you'd probably be traveling around to go see clients all the time, right? So you get yeah, it kind of- Yeah, every month pre-COVID, I was uh, probably 60% Hawaii, 40% here, maybe wow. even 70, 30. And yeah, it was, uh, it was starting to get, starting to get to be a drag. Um, yeah. So I'm actually pursuing some similar type business here in, in Colorado to kind of um, make my, make, make it make sense for me to be here more than that, more than there. Yeah. Similar, similar type of clients that we have there already trying to, trying to get, get the same type of um, business here going. And you're doing retirement retirement uh, planning, or is it just NFL clients? Are you taking every uh, anybody that uh, like just traditional type business? Oh, no, so yeah, so most of our book is large institutions. So we do institutional consulting. Okay. So a lot of it would be like large pension funds, uh, annuity funds, health health and welfare funds. Um, so there's some pretty significant uh, similar business here in Denver that I've been been working on now for about two years, but yeah. it just takes time to develop those relationships. They don't know me. I'm well known in Hawaii, but not, not as much here in, in, in Denver, but uh, starting trying to leverage off of the relationships we have in Hawaii that are in the similar or in the, um, uh, the same type of union work um, because they all seem to know each other, the, the leaders. Yeah. So, leaning on the our uh, or asking i should say not leaning asking our clients in hawaii if they could make a a warm intro to the people here and just put in a just kind of just where it's a warm lead versus a cold call yeah it's all about relationships yeah so really it's it's um that's probably 80 percent of our of our of our book that we manage is that type of client and out of that out of these big big accounts that we have as people are rolling out and um retiring then we pick up a lot of uh rollover business out of that okay yeah so a, a member has a half a million dollar annuity balance in the 250 million dollar annuity he's retiring we've got to know the guy he'll typically we don't get a hundred percent of them but we get a fair share where they'll reach out to us to help them manage that, that, that annuity. We convert it into a, to a personal IRA or re, to an IRA account, roll it from the big fund into the IRA and help them manage it. Whatever he's trying to, whatever he needs the money for to, you know, just accomplish what he, he has going on in this personal situation. Yeah. So from a global macro standpoint, since you're a professional money manager, where do you see, where do you see this market going with, uh, with inflation and the oil and the, you know, conflict yeah, and the East and stuff? Crazy. Just, uh, um, absolutely crazy, volatile, volatile market. Um, um, I'm still fully hundred percent invested in the market. Uh, I've been, over the years, taking profits, big profits that I had off, and looking for opportunities to reinvest at a at a at a lower PE ratio or lower price, and that's been helpful, especially when the correction with COVID, when the market tanked thirty five percent, there was a lot of great buying opportunities. Yeah. And, um, the thing is, when it gets like that, is that not to panic. Yeah, and, that's, and that was the biggest. If I was to say one reason why we had our greatest year in 2020 and 2021 is we didn't panic. Yeah, we, we, all of these big plans have well thought out investment policy statements that are designed to weather up and down and in between. And when a lot of it's just holding the hand of the client and and reassuring them. When the market's down 25, 30%, and that's not the time to sell. Because yeah, you, you basically just locked in locked in your loss. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we basically go for the ride. The theme, that was the theme for 2020. And immediately after things, um, so it was at its low mid March of 2020. By the time we got till the summer of 2020, they were all back in the positive. And for that year, a lot of them were up like 35%, 30%. Yeah. If they had panicked, they had panicked and sold in March of, of, of 2020. Yeah, they would have they would have had a totally different experience. Yeah. So I think this is much the same. There's a lot going on. You know, the inflation um, part kind of worries me. The amount of debt in the in the on the balance sheet, national balance sheet, uh, federal balance sheet really concerns me because we have to reconcile that at some point. Um, so I talk to and hear from a ton of really really bright people all over the country and um they're still and i agree i think through this year through 2022 we'll probably be okay it's going to be a volatile time where you're going to see the market up uh it'll be up and down and up and down depending on what the news is more be it's more news sensitive mm -hmm. whatever the whatever the big announcement was with rates or inflation that can cause a cause that particular day to be affected but if um everyone is still positive they, but going into 2023 totally different story and so uh, that's where they feel if, if we're going to start to see um uh, a recession or um any kind of like major pullback it's going to be out outside of uh, what's going to be in 2023, not 2022. Okay. So you talk to a lot of smart people. We have a lot smart, a lot of smart people, at our firm, they look at the, the yield curve of, of the bond market. Yeah. How the, the, if you look at a, the yield curve, you should get paid as the yield curve goes out in maturity. So starting from like treasury bonds, all the way up to 30 year bonds, a 30 year bond should pay a higher interest than the short term stuff. Whenever yeah. that gets, whenever that inverts and goes the other way, that's a that's a historically a, a sign for a recession in, in about a year to eighteen months from that point. It hasn't inverted yet, but it's teetering. It's getting close. Yeah. Will that's you let us know? That, that's something to <laughs> to uh, be aware of and to watch. Can we uh, just get a Leo alert when it happens? What was that? Can we just get the Leo alert when it happens? We, you can perfect <laughs> perfect we know a guy yeah we know a guy now <laughs> yeah so it's it's uh it's a weird time it's just um uh the, the biggest thing that concerns me is this is more so the debt the seven trillion dollars of new debt um and how that's affected the u.s dollar and where the u.s dollar is headed and how that can play in. So it's something we watch every day. And, you know, cause we, we manage these big, large funds and we meet with these guys quarterly. So we have to kind of be on top of it. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's um, still at the end of the day though. I don't think it's time to be in a panic mode. Okay. Well, they've, they've held it together so far. So, so far, yeah. so good. Yeah. Yeah. So do you do you miss the NFL agent stuff? Do you miss uh, kind of being in that realm with dealing with the players and taking care of their contracts? I do um, to a, to an extent. Um, that was a fun period for me, although I was just and the main reason why I transitioned. Um, I just wasn't comfortable with where the industry was headed. So when I first got in in two thousand three as a licensed agent, you typically for a for a draftable type player, which, you know, draftable in, in my mind is like you get invited to the NFL combine that kind of puts you in the radar of being drafted. Yeah. Uh, everybody else who doesn't go there yet, yeah, you could probably get drafted, but your percentages go way down if you don't get, get an invite to the combine because they only they send about 250 players in the country to that event. Yeah. And uh, anyway, back in those early days of in the business, I was spending to get a good guy. You're probably spending 10 to 15 grand on just training them, feeding them, 
uh, housing them and giving them some transportation, maybe a small per diem uh, for three months. So you're like big, you're big sugar daddy for those three months, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then you have to do that. Otherwise you can't even sign a guy if you don't, if you can't sign a draftable guy. Cause yeah. he's getting that from a whole slew of other guys. Right. So what, what was uncomfortable for me, it was, I was comfortable doing that, but when it changed from doing that plus writing a check to a guy for another 20, 25 grand, just to get him to sign with you, I wasn't comfortable with that. Oh, it, was, yeah. it, it was just going and it was heading there really fast because other agents were doing it. And, um, <laughs> if you don't do it, you just, you're just eliminated you, out of, out of the, uh, out of the race. So yeah. you were, so agents were paying the athletes to sign with them legally. It's all legal. As yeah. 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 But like 20 in, grand. As as, yeah. So they were, wow. they were doing the, their package, their whole package to the player before the player chose them as their agent was, I'm going to do all that stuff that I just mentioned. Plus I'm going to give you, I'm going to basically front end my fee to you and yeah. give it to you cash or in a check. And I, to me, it was just, it was getting out of control, man. I could only yeah. imagine what it is now because the, the NFL, the revenue in, in the league is just only going one way and up. Right. So sure. as it goes, continues to grow, um, these guys are making more and more money. And agents get more and more creative to get those guys to sign with them versus the competition. And yeah, if you're a 23, 24 year old, why would you uh, say no to, even though you like the guy like me who played the game and thought I was great on that, why would you sign with me if I was going to stick to just the, the basics and give you your training and all that versus a guy who was going to do all that plus give you yeah. cash, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was, just, it was getting out of control because uh, for a, uh, and I only played in, in the uh, – my highest draft pick was a second rounder. Everybody that else that I had was like four, fifth, sixth round. So if you're put 20, say if you're into a, into a sixth rounder, you're, you're not even breaking even in year one. You're, you're, you're pretty much breaking even in year two. Although is I, you're making – just holding on to life that this to his second track. Yeah. So you, everybody's reality is everybody's fronting the money. With your money. Friends. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Huh? Oh, yeah. there was a little. There was a yeah, little so delay there. In order to in order to compete. Yeah. So in order to compete, you have to do that. Um. And I just I just wasn't. I just slowly got, I, I, can you still hear me? Yeah. It was a little, it was a little breaking up there, but yeah, so you know, is like there. all the agents that were signing the contracts were working the whole first year for free for no money. So the, all the agents were only making money after year one, just to get that big contract. I think we may have lost. Leo, him. are we still with you? Are you still with us? personal money you just got a little connection issue i'm here you not hear me oh i think we're getting we think we're coming back i think you're back yeah it might just be a connection issue maybe slow internet or something i'm not sure maybe it's the just the connection You know what? Let's do this. Let's take 30 seconds and we'll come right back. Are you ready to push your limits? Push your boundaries. Get tough. See what's out there. Don't let anybody hold you back. Are you ready to take on the world? Well, now it's time to go mod to head. A new energy drink be part of every adventure that you're on. Are you ready to keep up?
Are we back? We can't hear you, Leo. We can see you, but we can't hear you. We love technology. We'll figure it out. No worries. Oh, good. No, no sound. <laughs> Maybe hit the, um, is there a mute button? No, he's not muted. No, he's not muted. He had the ear pods in there for a second. I thought we were going to get him back. Nope. No, nope. we can we can see you talking. We just can't hear it. What we can do, Leo, if you want to leave and come back in, just click back on the invitation link and try to come back in. We can try that. <laughs> okay. In that link. Okay. Yeah. Well. Perfect. We'll bring you back in. I don't know that I've ever considered the career of an NFL agent before. It's yeah, that's a different different career path for sure. Right? Cuz like you never you don't know about what you don't know. I knew very little about aviation. And <laughs> suddenly I feel like my scope has wildly increased when it comes to aviation now. Who knew? I didn't know. And even thinking about cuz people think like, "Oh yeah, being an NFL agent would be so awesome." And I'm sure that there are elements of it that is really awesome, but there are so many little nuances that we don't know about. Who knew that you ended up playing Sugar Daddy? <laughs> I know. Probably nobody thought that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Who knew? I'm so curious to talk to him about his time in the NFL just to see. Because I think so many of us have it romanticized as being superheroes. Yeah. Right? Like football is your life. Like that's so cool. And I wonder like what the behind the scenes stuff is that he hasn't spoken about that we get to know about. Come well, back, yeah. Leo, come back. It's definitely glorified. I mean, people don't really realize that it's the diet and the extra, you know, just lifting all the time. You're working out, you're traveling, you know, the, the travel schedule is pretty intense, you know, and just the workout, yeah. your body's under constant, yeah, constant pain and constant recovery all the time. All the time. Yeah. All the time. All the more reason for those cold plunges and a Wim Hof breathing. If you don't know what we're talking about, watch episode three. <laughs> yeah. Wim Hof. Do you want to try? Do you want to try to re-invite Leo? Yeah, I'll send him a send him another uh, another invite. Yep. Just make sure that he's got what he needs to join us on again. He's gonna try from his iPad. Oh, beautiful! We love technology. Technology is what makes the world go round, and we're here for it. But in the meantime, uh, so we are launching an energy drink. You just saw the commercial for it. We had our first iteration of it a few months ago. We made some tweaks and adjustments to the label. And ladies and gentlemen, we are now looking at 14 boxes of product. So we are ready for retail. So if you or anybody you know is in food and beverage, hit us up. Help us find some distribution for this incredible energy drink because it's awesome. It's so good. Yeah, convenience stores. It's going to be in bars and restaurants because we have a new drink called the Afterburner, and it goes along with um, Fireball Whiskey. So right? that's, that's really good. We tried that. It's super smooth. We we can't so it tastes it like it. Christmas. It's so easy to drink. It's almost dangerously easy to drink. <laughs> Yeah, with summer coming up, it's going to be a popular drink. Oh, for sure. For Except, sure. Yeah, 12 dune rolls around and by the pool. Pop, pop the top. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So the energy drink is off and running. We've got the coffee coming along handily. So we are just moving and grooving all the way around. Yeah. Um, yeah, what else we got going I don't know, but how many times have you had lunch with really impressive fancy pants people? That was one of the most interesting conversations. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the gentleman we had lunch with today, he's 96 years old. He invented GPS. Okay. Can you just, can, <laughs> can you just take that in for a second? He invented GPS. 
And I made the mistake of saying, how did you get into it? And a friend of mine said, he didn't. He, 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 he created it. Into it. He did it. And then other other people after it was invented got into it. And I was like, oh, yeah. good point. Cool. Cool. Thank you. I'm just going to sit here. Can you just imagine that? I mean, think about how many times you open your GPS or you use it on a regular basis. It's programmed in cars. It's in every mode of transportation. It eliminated the, the need for MapQuest. Right? <laughs> right now, Leo's looking for his iPad and he's like, GPS, my I iPad. My, iPad. my iPad. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. And we sat across from the guy that created GPS today. I I mean, I felt like I should do something impressive for the rest of my day. <laughs> like, I read my book this morning. It was fantastic. That was that was wild. And I, what I love is that if you look at the people that we've had on our show, if you think about Justin and Steve and Leo, they all follow passion. They're all led by that sense of, purpose and excitement and they're doing something that they love and they're not doing something that feels um safe right yeah. they're pushing their boundaries they're really going for it and i just have so much respect for people that are just going to say like f it i'm doing this thing yeah that's why it'd be interesting to hear leo's story about the nfl because to get into the nfl from, you know, being a kid in Hawaii, how many kids, we'll have to ask him, how many kids right. from Hawaii grew up and said, I'm going to play in the NFL? I mean, if you lived in Southern California and you went to a high school where all the kids were coming out of the out of school going to USC or something, maybe. Yeah, and you're but grappling for a spot at UCLA or USC or you're trying to get to like a big conference school. I can't, I can't think of it. I can't think of any others who are, well, I mean, obviously I haven't paid much attention to all the, the draft picks from Hawaii. But I can't imagine that there's a huge population of people. It feels to me like it'd be more along the lines of I'm going to be a professional surfer. I'm going to do something in extreme sports. I'm going to be out on a boat. And he's like, no, no, I'm going to get to the NFL. And he did. Yeah. Well, and the competition that you have in Hawaii is pretty limited, too. I mean, you're not traveling to Arizona and Vegas and Northern California and Colorado and Texas to play against these big schools and all these kids. You have a very limited group of kids you can play against to get better. So that says a lot about Leo's, yeah, his not only passion, but obviously his, his skill level. And some grit, right? Like that tenacity. And then to have a long-term career. In the NFL is also super impressive. I really hope he finds his iPad and we can get him back on to talk about those things. Yeah. Yeah. And hey, speaking of, there he is. How are we doing? Is that better? There he is. Yeah, you're back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we I were just to, talking um, about you. I had to get the link on my iPad. So I had to I wasn't showing up in my in my uh text messages, so I had to just email it to myself. Perfect. Oh, all right. Well, thanks for doing that. That's yep. that's great. I'm glad you're back. We were you can hear me talking, clear now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we good. were just talking yeah. about your time in the NFL and how and how you made that happen growing up in Hawaii. Wow. Um, so I uh, grew up in a sports home. I'm a baby of eight kids. Uh, I'm the youngest. Five old... Um, Four older brothers, three older sisters. All my older, four older brothers were all great in Little League and Pop Warner High School. I, uh, well, in their younger ages, they were like phenomenal. All of them were. I was the complete opposite. <laughs> Fact. Let me... So this is me. This is me. This is me when I was like, I think I was like 11 years old. Wow. You don't look like an NFL prospect, right? 11. Okay. <laughs> and so, can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, th that was the very first year I played, played football. Anyway, so long story short is um, all my brothers had their doubts. <laughs> <laughs> but I just I had a father who had um who had instilled this dream in me when I was a young, probably in third, second, third grade, about and I think it was 
probably a, his own dream for himself to have one of his five boys play in the NFL. Yeah. And so every time I remember watching it with him when I was younger, he would say, I like out of the blue, that's going to be you one day. Wow. And it was like, Oh, great. Okay. And so fast forward, you know, get into high school, have some uh, some success in in high school, especially my senior year, where I get all these offers to go play to a lot of really good schools. And I decide to stay home and play in, at the University of Hawaii, mainly because I knew, well, I had two, my two brothers right above me both played there. <coughs> and I knew my dad really wanted to just get in his car and drive to Aloha Stadium and see me play. He didn't want to have to get on an airplane. Yeah. And so I said bye to some pretty, pretty notable schools and said, hey, you know what? Thanks, but I'm going to just stay home. Yeah. Which, so ones, did doing you that. Say, which ones did you say no to? Said no to Notre Dame. Said, said no to Cal Berkeley, Washington. <laughs> some, some really good schools wanted me, but. And that's the, those are the really big ones, but there was a lot of other ones like BYU. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. Man, uh, Notre Dame must have been hard to walk away from. Say again? Notre Dame must have been hard yeah, to walk was, away it from. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. So anyway, so, and then I get thrusted. So I was a tight end in in high schools, which means I'm not even a lineman yet. I, I'm a hybrid receiver and a, I do some blocking, but... So I show up my first, I show up as a true freshman at Hawaii. I'm, I trained my butt off that summer. So I, I went from like, I, I put on like 35, 40 pounds of muscle. And so I show up very first week in, of camp. They had some injuries to some veteran linemen. So the coaches kind of use me or want to see what I got. So they throw me in on a live drill, a Oklahoma type drill where you have one defensive lineman and one offensive lineman, and then you have a running back and a linebacker, and it's just like they put the ball down, and it's it's just a it's a pride type drill. <laughs> yeah, and so I did really well against the starter at uh, on defense. <laughs> uh, look at that! When was the last time you saw that photo? Oh, uh, yeah, it was a lo long time. <laughs> and so yeah, you put on some muscle for sure. <laughs> so yeah, but that was my senior year. So. Um, the, the head coach calls practice, has everybody come up. He has me stand up, and he asks me in front of the whole team, go in, what did we recruit you as? I said, tight end. <laughs> he goes, well, as of today, you're my starting left guard, so you better learn fast. Wow. <laughs> wow. And I never seen tight end after that from that day on. I instantly had to get entrenched. And so basically, I got thrown in the fire from – the get-go as a as a true freshman and uh uh started my my whole freshman year and well toward the end of the year i came down with mono which was a bummer i i, oh. I missed the ending part of the season due to mono i was just out of commission period uh and um mononucleosis <laughs> and and then the next few years were kind of injury prone it was like a knee injury here, a shoulder surgery there. And and it wasn't, everything kind of somewhat came together my junior year, but my senior year was where everything came together. And um, uh, so much so that I was the only one that year out of our team. And we had a really good team that year. We went nine and two, played in our first bowl game. I was the only one that got invited to the NFL Combine. Wow. Um when we had some really good players in my senior class. So I was kind of shocked by that, that I was the only one. Um, but it told me at that point, when I got that invitation in the mail and I opened that bad boy up, that, that's when I knew <laughs> I, I, that this is, this is going to, this is very well going to be a reality. And then, so I went there and, and tore, really tore up the combine in a good way. I was either first or second in every category, running, jumping, lifting, agility so i went from a probably a late rounder like a back then had 12 rounds i went probably went from like a 10th 11th rounder to a first day early first day guy because i was because i was so athletic um so i ended up getting drafted 60th overall which now would have been in the second round 
because now there's only seven rounds. Back then was 12. And back then we, we had 28 teams, not 32. And uh, yeah, it was literally, so my whole family's, I was already married, already had our, ch our first child. I had my whole family and my wife's whole family. I had like 40 people in there in, at their house. Wow. And ESPN, didn't even have ESPN2 yet, it was just ESPN. The telecast was just ending at about 58th, 59th pick. They were kind of wrapping up the show. And so literally, as they're, as they're saying goodbye to everyone, the phone rings. I pick it up, and it's it's a guy named Pat Curran. He was a business manager with the, with the Chargers. He said, how would you like to be a Charger? I said, oh, I think I would like that a lot. <laughs> And he said, well, we just picked you with our 60th pick. Congratulations. And I let the news out and everybody just going crazy. Oh, wow. And uh, that night, that night I had to get on a plane and fly out. It was, it was everything at that point is just like, re things are moving really fast. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So that's my rookie year. It's one of my rookie cards. Um, so like, just, just like in, in college, I got thrown in the fire pretty early as a rookie at left tackle. Um, yeah, it was, I had to, I had to learn quickly from the veterans and, and learn the difference between being a college player and being a, a professional player. Vast difference. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I had some really good veterans. Actually the guy that he was like 11, 12 years in the league, he was, they basically kept him around to mentor me. Uh, he was older. He, he couldn't move very well, but he, he knew the game so well, and he knew he was a seasoned veteran. It's just his body had deteriorated. So he, they kept him around on the active roster to basically – and I was replacing him. I was taking his job. At, Whoa. But but not, not really taking his job, but he was – and he was fine with it. He just wanted another credited season, another credit for his pension and, and all that. But so he, and we ended up becoming really close friends. Actually, he was one of my main scouts. So he ended up working as a scout. I think he still is one. He's got to be because he, he worked his up his way up from just being an area scout to being like a, um, head of scouting. I believe he's now with the 49ers. His name is Joe Patton. And so he kind of mentored me that first year and uh, it was vital to have his input because uh, yeah, the game is so fast and so, so um, complex. There's so much going on that the, the viewer doesn't even see. Uh, but um, when you're in it, to have that kind of feedback from a veteran guy is like gold. Yeah, I was. I'm grateful for guys like him and and um, others that in that first year really helped me out to because um, I was thrown in thrown in the mix. I didn't have time to. Uh, I had to learn really fast. Well, one thing I was just reading uh, last night or this morning, I just pulled up an article on the L.A. Times and it was saying something about Gil Bird. How um, Gil, was it? Gil Bird that was a friend of yours on the Chargers, and he was kind of supporting you and uh, yeah. You got, so I heard at the so, same time. Yeah, he was he was a big time mentor, and he wasn't he was a defensive back. He was a cornerback, but but he and I he and I uh, hit it off. Um, his wife and my wife, I mean our families. We used to trade off. Uh, so in the NFL season, you you really only have Monday night and Tuesday to do whatever you want to do. So you play a game on Sunday, you come in on Monday, you watch the film, you have a light workout. Then so you have that night, if you wanted to go out with your wife, that would be the time to do it on Monday night because then you're off on Tuesday. And so we would trade off, you know, we would take his two boys. Uh, he, he had two boys and they would go on a date night, vice versa. He would take our, at that time we had, we had only one, but we had our second one that following year, 91. Uh, they would they would watch our kids and we would go on a date night. Uh, so we had that kind of relationship, and he was just a also a big time spiritual mentor for me. Uh, um, just just a, a strong Christian faith, and 
uh, that's a whole that's a whole nother discussion. If you, if you guys want to go there, I'm, I'm happy to do so. But so that was where a lot of our connection came to was just our commonality or in, in our faith. Yeah. And um, um, yeah, we still stay in contact. There's only a few guys that I still stay in contact with. He's definitely one of them. Oh, that's awesome. Well, the one thing I, I really resonated with that article was, you know, the fact that uh, he was getting hurt and his knee blew out or something. He had such a great attitude about being like grateful and thankful for such a great career in the NFL. And yeah, um, I guess that kind of made an impact on you, right? To kind of just reset everything and say, wow, this is that's one way to look at it. That's to be super grateful is what you had mentioned or something. Absolutely. Um, yeah, because it is you realize that you're 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 part of a select group of athletes that have the opportunity to play in that level from the tens of thousands of college athletes that you're like in the, it's not even 1%, it's less than 1% of the college, total college athletes get to play in the NFL. So it's, it's, uh, I never took it for granted. It's something that every year you have to, you have to put in the work in the off season and get yourself ready for the 16 week long season um, and you have to deal with whatever bumps come in the road as they come. So I've had, I've had, I've had nine surgeries over, over my career. Wow. Uh, one in college, eight in the NFL. And, you know, you, you have to deal with that. Uh, you have to deal with the, the rehab, the, um, making sure that that doesn't hamper your ability to, um, be wanted by the team <laughs> yeah. and yeah because every every year they have a draft and a bunch of new kids are getting pumped into the system like a hundred of them 120 yeah. usually uh from the from the overall draft usually about a hundred actually make it uh actually make an active roster every year so wow. there's that turnover every year and um it's a real thing so you 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 know so i came in and i took an old guy's spot just Joe Patton when I was a rookie and you just you just stay in it as long as you can knowing that someday there's going to come a day where you're going to be Joe Patton <laughs> you're going to become the mentor that's right so um yeah it's it's um it's a crazy business it's a it is a it's so hard to describe to people because when you're in it it's just it's like it's totally not the real world. For one thing, you're getting paid a lot of money to do something you love to do already. You would do it for free. Right. Uh, you really would because you really love the game, but you, you're almost like um, having to look at it from a different lens and it's not the rah, rah, rah of college anymore. It's like, this is your livelihood. Right. And, um, it took me a while to, to really understand that. But so like, for instance, day one in mini camp, I'm like running around, the, running around like a wild maniac, this child, yeah, young and I want to make an impression. The veteran guys can put your hand down and show, hey, young boy, just ease on down. Now. <laughs> just yeah. Calm down, calm down. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of that in the first year. Um, and, th and then you get it, you understand. Year two was way different experience than year one, having had that that one year under your belt. But it was uh, it was something that uh, I'm glad we just blessed to have been able to to do. My wife and I both. I consider her. Whenever I say, I don't say I got drafted as we got drafted. For um, sure. She's my high school sweetheart. She was through every up and down and every surgery and every every disappointment. She feels it just like I do. And um, we're celebrating 35 years this, this June. Wow. Congratulations. That's incredible. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So great. Yeah. So it's um, truly blessed. I realize it. And um, I'm even more grateful for because a lot of guys have a lot of uh, really hard transition out of the league you know a lot of them just go through the the the, the percentage of divorce is like like astronomical in the nfl mm -hmm. it's i think it's north of 80 percent 
uh, because their whole career, their whole identity is wrapped up into that. And mm. there's no real foundation underneath. And so when all that goes away it, within a couple years, yeah, I know a, a ton of guys that, yeah, they, 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 um, who are part of that 80% guys that yeah. I played with. So I'm even more grateful that we looked at the league and this is part of Gil's, Gil Bird's um, input with me as well is, is that was the, our faith was our, the glue that held everything together held. Cause this, just think about it. You go from being a poor college athlete to instantly where you're making 80,000, 90,000, hundred thousand a week. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff as a 23, 24 year old and get yourself into all kinds of stuff, all right? Kinds of but trouble, just having yeah. a grounding to realize that, hey, man, this is, this is not going to be forever. Uh, most players only play a few years. That's why they make the pension vesting. Uh, you have to play it. it. Used to be four years. Now it's three years because most guys don't even see the third year. Yeah. They just cycle through and they're out. Um, so I'm just grateful more, mainly for that, that we went into the league with uh, a total different mindset than most guys go into it in because there's so many traps out there in it that I see a lot of guys fall in. And uh, yeah, they had this great experience, but it was totally different than mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, well, sometimes you it foundation. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't matter how physically strong you are if you're not mentally strong. Yeah, yeah. The mental part is is um, probably probably outweighs the the physical. Um, totally. And yeah, for me, for me, it was it was more so vital that I set boundaries in the locker room with guys, uh, and they knew what I what I was about and what I stood for. Because you can only imagine what these grown men are doing after practice, right? When everything is done and guys are going about their way. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I had to I had to set clear, clear boundaries as to what I was about. So yeah. they would ask, a, you know, a few times, but eventually uh, after a while, they just stopped asking. Right. And I, I would just get my butt home to my wife and to my kids and they would do whatever they're going to do. But that was... That was um, something that I'm I'm, I'm super grateful for, because ev everything it would have been a lot different without that in place. Yeah, and how many years total did you spend in the league? Years. Yeah. Eight. See, yeah, eight. that's that's awesome. Yeah, it had a lot to do with your longevity. When you say too, is just that kind of that clear guidance and that um, that no question. Yeah, no question. You got it. You got a plan B and, and you already, you have that support at home and all that sort of thing. Yeah, no question. It was, um, so like for instance, um, you show up on a Sunday as a, as a wife of, of an NFL player, it's like a beauty pageant, pageant show, man. Yeah. Like who's got the biggest bling, who's <laughs> got the nicest fur coat. That's because they all sit in the same section at the stadium, <laughs> right? And they're all like looking loose. They're all like checking each other out. I'm so proud of my wife. She never got, and that's her personality and her upbringing. She would go to, she would go to the game in sweats. <laughs> <laughs> Love she, it. Had, she wanted nothing to do with that, that, that whole thing. And we were just, we would bring our kids to all the home games. So they'd be up in there. We wanted them to experience it all. And um, yeah, we just, and I think it was just more, it, it all roots back to the foundation that I was referring to earlier that Gilbert had a lot to a lot of a big role to play in with the whole thing. Um, because, yeah, it's you realize that it's this is just a, a, a phase in your life. It's going to at some point come to an end. And then you're because you're, most guys retire there. I mean, when I re, when I was done playing, I was 31 years old. Wow. And, you know, you can only play so much golf. You can only go and, you know, so I was like, okay, now what? 
I've done this for 20 years. Every year I was from from this picture <laughs> till till um my last year in the league with the Ravens or was really with the Broncos but is is uh, okay now what what's the transition um so that part of it yeah it took me a little while to cuz I didn't have it in place yet I I really didn't know I was just really just focused on playing um I didn't have a business or anything I just and uh, um I just kind of and I think I shared this with you, Ben. So after I was done playing, I ended up working with the agency that represented me. Uh, I did that for like three years where I, I did some recruiting for them, uh, mainly linemen, mainly linemen out of Hawaii because I had a, a, a tie there with Hawaii linemen. Yeah. And there's uh, Hawaii's known for linemen. And then I, um, so I did some recruiting, but I also trained their offensive linemen, uh, kind of clean up their technique in that, in that window of time between their end of their end of their senior year, <laughs> the end of their senior year to uh, uh, the the draft, there's all kind of things that happen in, in that window of time, and that's what prompted me to go and get licensed. I did that with them for three years unlicensed, and I loved it so much. That's why that's why I ended up getting uh, licensed and and going the agent route. Well, that was a great, yeah, great transition because it allowed you to kind of keep connected to the game, keep a yeah. bunch of friends and yeah. keep that contact. Of, so, of yeah, I was able to leverage the relationships I already had as a player in, in, in the NFL. Now as an agent, big. So I, I was I had a lot of coaching relationships that they, they remembered me as a player that I was able to leverage. leverage. But um, anyway, yeah, it's, that's that. That seems like a lifetime ago doing that. <laughs> that <laughs> playing in that NFL seems like two lifetimes ago. <laughs> well, one of the most fun I I had with you was doing the uh, like some of the endorsement stuff for uh, Domaton Pecco. We were working on some stuff for you know the hair. You know, he had the yeah. big hair. And yeah. for those of you that don't know, like Domaton Pecco, just this huge Samoan guy with hair coming out of this life side, just amazingly huge guy. And so we were working on doing a. Uh, the the kind of like a Troy Palomalu commercial. He was known for the big hair and the and the and the um, you know hair conditioning and shampoo. Yes. So. so he was my longest. So he played sixteen years. So yeah. that's why it took. I was just waiting for him to retire. <laughs> so when he got out, that's when I I let my certification lapse. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, yeah, I didn't renew it because I was. I, I would. There you go. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. That is impressive hair. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was did. another really. He was. He was another really awesome client, man. He. He. Um, he. He did everything um, we asked of him to do from from the get go, and. Um, he was a leader on the Bengals from pretty early. I mean, they were, um, they were, he wasn't a starter his rookie year, but he was in the light. He was in the rotation by year two. He was, um, he was a starter. And after year two, they're already wanting to renew his four year deal two years into it. And throw the big money at him, which teams never do teams yeah. make, make you play the whole four years out. So they're basically advancing his, so he, he went from just being a normal rookie kind of salary deal to making making the big bucks going into year three, which typically never happens. But that was much because of the the value he had um, gained with the club. Yeah, I think he had already become or was shortly after that became a, a team captain for many, many consecutive years, defensive captain. And... Uh, yeah, those kind of guys and those experiences you do miss because that was a lot of fun. When you guys had done a show on BBC, right? About uh, they did a show on you guys for the Samoans and the and Hawaiians right. and the, you and the got a great memory, man. Yeah. Well, that was super cool. It was just it was such an interesting show because it was just like such a dynamic group of personalities and everybody was yeah. so hard and yeah. So Samoa which I've been to many times. I used to coach some camps there 
uh, in the early 2000s. So I was already done playing, but I used to go there every summer with a guy named Joe Salavea. Okay. Joe Salavea. I got a picture of so Joe Salavea. He was a um, he was a defensive lineman for the Tennessee Titans. And he's he's born and raised in American Samoa, but he he went to college at Arizona, and um, nice. and like a lot of them. So now he's like a big time coach. He's he's I think defensive coordinator at um at Oregon. Oh, okay. he's gonna, he's going to be a head coach soon in college football. How exciting! That's fun to see. Yeah. So like this is me. This is this is me coaching a football camp. Coaching a football camp in American Samoa. There's me right there. That's at the oh. stadium in Pongo Pongo. Nice. And all these all these kids <laughs> probably had like, I don't know, 300 kids at least. Most of them didn't even have shoes. They're like barefoot. Oh. And just some of the most amazing athletes, man. And uh, so all that to say, per capita, there's, there's more NFL players from with Samoan ancestry than any other bar. It's, it's not even close. Yeah. Wow. There's Big Joe right there. Oh, how cool. Yeah. Yeah, there's Big Joe right that there. That's a big man. So we would go there every year, and it was just a blast, man. We would um, we would do the camp. Then we had a lot of free time to just go around the island. It's such a beautiful place, beautiful island. Uh, it's like going back in time. It's uh, – there's not much development there. It's just like real natural, still just beautiful. Um, yeah, so there's, if you just go down any roster, any NFL roster, you're going to see um, anywhere from two to five Samoans on the team. Yeah. And you figure the island, the Samoa, there's only like, there's less than 70,000 people. Yeah. That's it. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. They grow so they grow um, big. So that whole that whole story that you're referring to is kind of to highlight that. Yeah. That this is um and they're just kind of they're kind of meant to be big they're meant to play that position, play uh, defensive or offensive line because their bones are the way they're built and they're just um usually they're um um big in the legs and big in the butt and that's like Make that's sure. all natural. they're not even lifting weights yet yeah <laughs> u of a is u of a is my hometown school that's i'm a wildcat and okay. i just going to watching those guys and they always do the haka before yeah. the game and just watching them come out the number of samoans on that team yeah, was amazing what years were you amazing there? I had, I had tickets. I had, I was holding season tickets there, two thousand two to two thousand eight. So, so I was there a Dick lot. Dick Tomey was the head coach, right? Uh I think I so. During so. that time, yeah. So Dick Tomey was my head coach at, at the University of Hawaii before he went to Arizona. Wow. So he was there for ten years. He coached my older brothers. He recruited me, and then he left. After my sophomore year, that's when he took the Arizona job. And he was at Arizona for another, I think, 15 years. For a while. Yeah. yeah oh, my gosh. Time. I loved it. And I sat right in the end zone. It was so much fun. I loved going to games there. But interesting story about Dick Tomey was um, he was the first coach back in the probably late 70s, early 80s to start recruiting out of Samoa. Wow. That was smart. Smart, man. So smart. So smart. So he he was the first ones. He was one of the first ones to go there personally, because back there it's all about you gotta you gotta kiss the ring of the dad, man. You gotta get in with the dad. The dad is like the chief, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, whoever told Coach told me this, let him uh, gave him some good advice. So he would go in the living room and talk to the father and and. Uh, yeah, they got a lot of amazing athletes over the years. Uh, Joe Salavea being one of them. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I know I know you guys speaking of speaking of family and there taking he is right there. Man. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, well, he was he was an amazing coach, man. He taught. He was. He was probably the. How would I put it? Um. The hardest coach to play for in that he demanded so much out of his players, but you knew he loved every single one. So you didn't mind going to the brick wall for him. Yeah. He just had that way of bottom where he did, he set the bar so high and he didn't lower the bar. You had to come up to the bar <laughs> in your in, in everything, in going to class, in the way you, if you're late to meetings, it, it was everything. It was the whole man, not just the guy in the field. It was the guy off the field, more so than the guy on the field. And uh, so there, there's hundreds of guys who, who will say that, that that man had the biggest impact on their life as far as being a husband, being a dad, as far as mentoring them without even knowing it while they, were, while, while they had four years with them in college. Yeah. Wow. Special dude. I love that about coaches. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of family and taking care of people, I know you got family. I know your kids are coming over and your grandkids are coming over. So we'll let you get no, they're to here already. They're in the, oh. they're in the other room. Okay. So we'll get you to them. So I just want to thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate catching up with you. It's so good to hear your voice and see your face and see you're doing well. You look so young. You, you must be, you must be doing something right. You're looking like you're getting younger by, by the day. Trying to stay active, man. I'm uh, living here in Colorado. Got some beautiful mountains. So I just went on a, a five mile hike this morning with a bunch of guys Sweet. and up in the mountains. It was so beautiful. And so I try to do as much of that kind of stuff as I can. And if not with the days that my wife is, is not doing her thing with her horse or, or uh, she's a horse therapeutic trainer. Then we're, oh, we're doing, so we do a lot cool. of walking, a lot of walking uh, at this park that's right next to our house. But, just, just trying to stay active. Can't yep. do all the running around anymore, but I can go on long walks and chase the grandkids around. Right. That's right. Keep <laughs> you right. <too> young. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Exactly. Well, thank you for joining us, Leo. It was so awesome to have you on here to hear some about your story. We have to have you come back. There's, I know there's more. Well, oh yeah, there is. There is. I'd love to. You guys just let me know when. Awesome. Absolutely. Thanks, Leo. Have a great all night. Right. Have have a great Easter. Yep, yeah, you too. Okay. All right. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, what a good dude. Right? <laughs> I mean, the oh wow. Yeah. You just you see him light up there towards the end talking about the the coaching and the Samoans and the and his buddies and like the camaraderie and all that stuff. Yeah. You could just see it, you could hear it in his voice. Unbelievably cool. Unbelievably cool. Well, that wraps up the end of this show. You guys hang tight for more stuff coming soon. I know we've got some stuff coming up uh, early next week. So yep. we'll be back. So thank you for watching and uh, we'll catch you next time.